We're going to wrap up this week's slides with preliminaries in R by talking just about some odds and ends, some little pieces I want to tell you about that I haven't gotten the chance to yet, but that will help to make things make sense a little bit as we move into the next week so, uh, of um, the class. So the first is the idea of missing values. You might form a vector and have a certain spot in it where you don't have the data available. You can code that in as you're creating the vector by using a, a special um, type of, of object, this NA, and that stands for not available. So you put this in the spot where you're missing the data, and then you can see when it prints out, it prints out like that. And you put the same value in, whether you're doing numeric, or in this case, I'm creating a vector that's a character, any of those other classes that we were looking at. And you can see in this case when it prints out, it doesn't include the quotation marks around it. An interesting story came out about this idea about a year ago, um, as of the time that I'm filming this. So uh, most programming languages have these kinds of markers for places where you're missing the data. And in, uh, in R, it's NA, but in a lot of other languages, it's, it's null. So there's um, a spot in California where they go around with the video cameras to record license plates and to identify the license plates of cars that are parked illegally or otherwise need to be ticketed. And then they put all of that into a database, but sometimes the software doesn't work. So they end up with these spots where they couldn't properly see what the license plate was. And so that database uses the null character in those cases. So it's got this spot where it's null and it just means that it couldn't get the information. Um, there was a guy there, though, who's a computer programmer, and he thought this was really cool that, that um, programming languages had these kinds of characters. And so he got the license plate that spells out null. And it turns out that the software thought that that meant every time that, that um, they couldn't recognize the license plate, that the ticket should go to him because he was the one with the car registered with the null license plate. So we ended up with $12,000 worth of parking tickets. I think he appealed and was able to get them taken, taken away, but I think he kept the license plate. So I don't know if that problem has continued to happen to him. But if you wanted to read the full story, uh, there was a write-up about it in Ars Technica from about a year ago. The next thing that I want to talk about is another way that you can pull out information from a column. In, in a data frame. So we talk some about the select function. If we have a large data frame and we want to pull out just some of the columns. If you want to pull out just one column, there's another thing that you'll see people doing often and it behaves a little bit differently. It gives you something a little bit different, which is why I want to talk to you about it. So it's the dollar sign operator, uh, just the character of the dollar sign. So for example, if you have a data frame, then you might want to pull out one of the columns. So I'm showing a little example one here where we've just got two columns. We've got one for color and one for value. And uh, the color has a character string for what color and then the value is a numeric. This data frame I've named example DF. If I want to pull out just the color column, I can do that by doing the name of the data frame and then a dollar sign and then the name of the column. This is an operator. In this case, you cannot have spaces around it. It needs to go directly in between with no spaces, the name of the data frame, and then the name of the column that you want to pull out. And you can see now it's pulled out just those two. Now, the way that this acts differently from select, if you use select, then it pulls that out, but it maintains the object class still as a data frame. So even if you select just one column, you will still have a data frame object that just has one column in it. With this dollar sign operator, you end up um, pulling out the column, but it goes back into that vector state. We talked a little bit about data frames as being vectors that have gotten stuck together. So this unsticks it and pulls apart, and then you have it to work with again as a vector. If we use the class function, you can see if we look again at extracting that column that way, that it's a character. So it's a vector with, with um, a data of type character. Another thing that's nice is you can use tab completion with this. So you can just put the first part of this and then our studio will fill in the rest. So we haven't taken a look at that tab completion yet. So uh, let's do a try of that. So we'll, we'll do the tipple package and then next um, we can define that data frame. And we've got color and that equals red. 
I can't remember the second color I have. We'll put blue. And then we can put oh. Okay, so we can take a look again at this. Here's our data frame. So our studio has something called tab completion. And if you start typing something, you can press the tab key and it will give some suggestions either for data frames that have been named or, or other components um, like functions. So you can see here our second thing is example data frame. So we can use that to complete it to save ourselves some time on typing. You can also use it after you've done the dollar sign operator. You can see as soon as I do that, we have popping up the two columns that exist in that data frame. And so then you can use the up or down arrow to select which one you want to do and then just press tab and it'll finish that out. So you can save yourself some typing. As a note, there are also some functions in the tidyverse for doing this, and we'll look a little bit of, at, at those. One example is the pluck function from par, and there's also, I believe, a pull function from dplyr that will let you, again, extract a single column and switch it back into the vector class instead of having a one column data frame. The next thing that I want to talk about are paste and paste zero. Um, so let's talk about paste first. We've used this already in some of the examples. But with paste, you can take a series of different character strings. You can see here I've got three. So each character string is the piece that's inside the quotation marks. If you put those inside as the arguments to that function, the output will be a single character string. You can see now there's just one set of quotation marks. So it's taken all of those pieces and stuck them together. By default, it will separate each of those with a space when you stick them together. That's a behavior you can change though. So for example, if you didn't want anything when you separate them, you can use the separate argument, SEP and paste, and you can set that to be empty. So we've got a quotation mark with nothing in between it here. When you run that, you can see everything's now uh, stuck together. A shortcut for this, because this is often something that you wanna do, is to use paste zero. So the default behavior for that is it sticks it together with no spaces. The next tidbit I wanted to talk about is um, has to do with assignment operations. So we talked about the gets arrow was a way to make that assignment. But another thing that you can do is you can use the equal sign. And you'll see both of these when you're reading people's code. I'm going to recommend in this class you always use the gets arrow. When you leave the class, you're welcome to use either, but I would recommend that you be consistent. Code can look kind of sloppy when it combines a mixture of one or the other. There are a few reasons that it's helpful to use the gets arrow. The first is it shows the direction of the assignment. So the arrow is pointing to the name that you're giving for, for the output. And you can actually um, use a gets arrow that points in the other direction if you want to have all of your code first and then assign the, the object later. So we can go back and look where we defined um, the data frame before. And let's say that we coded this first and wanted to check and see, and we see that it works. And now we decide, decide since we've gotten it to work, that we want to give it an object name. So we can use the up arrow. That's a shortcut that lets you go back to the last line of code that you evaluated. And you can actually put a gets arrow going the other direction after your expression. And you can define your um, your object that way. And you can see that that has succeeded in creating our object. So for right now, this is getting a little bit subtle. For right now, what I want you to know mainly is that these do the same thing. So if you're looking at somebody else's code or example code and you see an equal sign, it's doing pretty much the same thing as the gets arrow. So, you should understand that if you look at this piece of code where we're assigning a vector one to 10 with that string of 10 numbers versus this piece of code where we're doing the same thing but have replaced the gets arrow with an equal sign, that that's doing exactly the same thing. All right, the next piece, this seems to confuse people sometimes as they're getting started. When do I use quotation marks around something and when do I not? The simple answer to that is that you use quotation marks if you literally mean that specific character string. Times when you won't literally mean it, but when you're using the, the letters to refer back to something, are when it's a name of an R object. So if we look here, if you'll remember, we defined that example df, 
as a data frame, if we put that without quotation marks, R looks back to see what objects it has defined, and it gives us that as a definition. If we put the whole thing, though, in quotation marks and then run that, then R just prints out that literal string. It thinks that, that we literally mean that particular combination of characters. Another rule of thumb is you're never going to want to put those quotation marks on the left-hand side of an assignment operator, like a gets arrow or an equal sign. And again, that's because when you don't put quotation marks around a character string, you're using it either as the name of a function or the name of, a, of an object that you want to define or reference later. You don't literally mean that character string. So here's an example. We could create a vector with the names Harry and Ron, and if we put those in quotation marks, R will take that literally and print those out. We could also, though, uh, take these other strings and assign them to objects with those names. This time we're doing it without quotation marks. So now I've taken the phrase good at Quidditch, and I'm assigning that to an R object that I've named Harry. And then I'm taking good at wizard chess and assigning that to an R object that I've named Ron. Now, if I run that same vector, if I create that vector and use it with Harry and with Ron without quotation marks, R is going to look back and see that we defined those as, as objects. These are the names of objects. And so they'll go back and they'll pull the values stored in those objects and print those out. Now, I think most people grasp that, but then what makes it just a little bit confusing are there are these rules, but then there are a few cases where R lets you be lazy about the rules. And so that makes it feel a little bit like maybe you haven't understood it. So uh, we'll see some examples of this. One of them is when you call the library function. So the proper way to do this, um, not that you have to do it this way, but if you're following those rules, is to put the name of the package in quotation marks. We literally mean that string, that, that character string, is the literal name of our package. So this would be the proper way to do it. But the library function allows you to be a little bit lazy and leave off those quotation marks. So if you put the name without doing that, then that'll evaluate just fine. You can do it either way. Another example that we'll look at a lot in the next few weeks is you can refer to column names in the same way without referencing those in inside quotation marks. While we're on the topic of being lazy, another way to be lazy is you can leave off the formal argument names when you call a function. I've tried in the slides right now to be very careful to do the full spelled out way where we take a function and then we take the formal argument name and equals and then we put in the value that we want for that. However, you can leave this first part off. Now the trick there is that R will then match up any arguments you put in to the order that those arguments were defined when the function was written. So that means that if you do this, if you leave off that formal argument piece of it, you need to be really comfortable about what order the different arguments fall in. And we'll see some examples of that, but a lot of times people will leave this off, especially for the first value that they put in as a parameter when they're, when they're running the function. So in this example, we could leave off the x equals, and you can see here we're running that same thing, and we've left it off and it evaluates with no problem. All right, the next thing I wanted to talk about is a different um, notation for calling a function that comes from a specific package. So we talked before about the phone number package, and that has a function called letter to number. So in this R session, I haven't loaded that yet. So if we try doing letter to number, you can see that I can't find it. Now, in the past, we used the library to load the phone number package, and then we did this. But there's another way you can do it, too, without doing the library call. You can put the name of the library first, or the, the package that has this function, and then two colons, and then you can put in the name of the function that you want to run. And then we could do, for example, hello world. And you can see now it works. Now it's able to evaluate that. You won't use this very often as you get started in R because it takes you much longer to write. If every time that you use a function that comes from another package, you do that notation, it'll take quite a while. So it, it's much more efficient just to load the library once and then be able to call all the functions without this.
However, there are a few places in the book and in the examples in the slide where I'll use that notation. And sometimes that's when we were, we're working with two packages that have a function with the same name. And so in that case, if you change the order that you load those two, those two packages, then R could get confused about which one of the, the two versions you want to pull. Um, this can happen a lot. There, there are two popular packages called plier and dplyr that have some functions with the same name. So that's one case where it'll happen. There are just, in general, certain functions that are, are named in a lot of different packages um, that can cause these kinds of conflicts or confusion. I'm telling you this now too, though, because you can use a nice trick with that tab completion and then with this, this, um, this way of being able to call a specific package. So first of all, if you know a package that a function's in, but you can't remember na the name of the function, you can type out the name of the package and then the two colons. And then after that tab completion will give you the different values that you can use, the different functions that exist in that package. The other thing related to this is if you want to pull up a help file for a different um, functions in a package, you can do that same trick. And again, it's showing us the different help files that we have available, both ones that are at the, the specific level of functions and then also one that's more general for the whole package. And then you can see that pulls that up. All right, um, just to wrap up now, I wanted to talk and introduce you to the idea of another way of composing function calls. So we talked a little bit about this idea that you can put together some different nested function calls and R will evaluate the ones inside and then kind of work its way out. That can get really ungainly though, and so there's another way that you can do this using a special function called a pipe function. Uh, we will talk a little bit in the coming weeks about why it's named a pipe function. It is in a package called the greeter, which also has a wonderful story behind it, and we'll talk about that. But for now, I just want you to see this and have this idea kind of kind of percolating in your mind. So if we if we install and load the package McReader, then we have access to this funny looking operator that's called the pipe operator in R. And now what we can do is if we want to send the output of one function in as a, a value in the next function, then we can pipe it through instead of doing that kind of nested composition where we build out. So we could do paste for hello world and then pipe that into a print function. And then it's taking as the first argument of print the output that we had from this last piece. Here's another example we'll end on of how to use that. So earlier we looked at doing this kind of composition when we're extracting pieces from a data frame where we want to pull out both um, some rows, so we're using slice to do that, and some columns, so we're using select to do that. So in the example, I showed how we could do this in a nested way where we've got this slice call inside, and then we've got the select call wrapping that where the output from slice goes in as our data for the select call. This kind of process, though, you can already see it's going to get really confusing to be able to go back through and see what part was doing what later because of the way it's nested and you have to kind of play like find the parentheses to figure out um, how to unpack it. So with the pipe, you can line this up in a much clearer way where you can read down and see the actions that are happening. So in this case, we can run the slice first. And again, that was the piece that was on the inside here and then take the output of that and pipe it in, and it becomes the first argument, which is data for select. It becomes the first argument for select, and then we just need to fill out there with any of the remaining arguments that we had for that particular function call.